Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today we'll take a look at some of the issues surrounding immigration here in Wisconsin. More specifically, this special report will take a look at some of the challenges undocumented students face when it's time to apply for college, and they realize their immigration status may hold them back from fulfilling their dreams. And later in the show, we'll talk with Citizen Action of Wisconsin organizer, Luz Sosa. But now let's take a look at how thousands of students in our state get an education in the shadows. We get the job done. It's a hard line when you're an import, baby boy. It's hard times when you ain't sent for it. Braces feed the belly of the beast with a pitchfork. On August 1, 2001, a bipartisan bill was introduced by two United States senators. Orrin Hatch, a Republican from Utah, and Illinois Democratic Senator Dick Durbin. The bill was called the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors, better known as the DREAM Act. The proposed bill would provide conditional resident status for those who applied, allowing them to work legally in the United States. The requirements included passing a criminal background check, the applicant must demonstrate good moral character, must have graduated from a United States high school, and must have proof that they entered the country before the age of 16 and hasn't left the country in the last five years. Despite bipartisan support for the bill, the DREAM Act died in the Senate and has been reintroduced more than 10 times in both the House of Representatives as in the Senate. Today on the floor of the Senate, we had a chance to make a dream come true for tens of thousands of young people across America, a dream that they would have a chance to become part of the future of this great nation. While today's vote was a setback, it hasn't changed our resolve at all. Throughout our history, the expansion of freedom and justice has required determination, courage, and persistence. These young people are the next generation of leaders in America our doctors and lawyers and engineers and teachers, congressmen and senators. They must be part of the nation, the only nation that they've ever known. Supporters of the bill claim that the DREAM Act does not create an amnesty program, as amnesty is usually a widespread legalization of large amount of people. This bill had strict requirements for those who applied and would benefit mostly kids hoping to attend college. But critics argued it would reward undocumented individuals and encourage more of it, inviting fraud and shielding gang members from deportation. But in 2008, then-Democratic candidate for president Barack Obama promised to make comprehensive immigration reform a priority in his first year as president. But uh, what, I can first, get, what, I can guarantee, what I can guarantee is, is that we will have in the first year an immigration bill that I strongly support and that I'm promoting and that I want to move that forward as quickly as possible. In the first year? In my first year in office. But no one, including the president, would have predicted the collapse of the economy, which became priority number one for the administration, and left immigration reform on the back burner for the rest of his first term. In 2010, a version of the DREAM Act was introduced, this time in the House of Representatives, where it had a victory. On this vote, the yeas are 216, the nays are 198. The motion is adopted. The bill was then passed on to the Senate, where it needed at least 60 votes to move on before a final vote. Then, Senator Jeff Sessions led the opposition of 11 Republicans, and they successfully blocked the bill once again. Following the defeated vote, Dick Durbin had this to say. As long as I can stand behind this desk and grab this microphone and use my power as a United States Senator, I will be pushing for this DREAM Act. It is my highest priority. It is a matter of simple American justice. And I would hope that 11 Republicans who joined us last time will stop cowering in the shadows and come forward and join us in a bipartisan effort and not stop us procedurally from even debating and deliberating this critical issue. In June of 2012, the Obama administration signed an executive order known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Similarly to the DREAM Act, this ordered by the president had strict requirements for applicants and was limited to the benefits they would receive. 
It wasn't a permanent solution, but for many, this was a victory. I personally um, was able to get a different job because I was able to get a social security number. I was able to get, able to get a driver's license, so I no longer had to worry about being um, pulled over because the cop knew I didn't have a driver's license. Um, and I was also able to travel within the country, you know, attend conferences and, um, you know, go to new cities and whatnot. So that was great. But now, you know, as a college graduate, um, I'm in the same scenario that other people are in. Like, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, maybe a year from now we'll be undocumented or, you know, we'll have to, in a way, go back into the shadows and whatnot. But an executive order signed by a president can easily be undone by the next president. In June of 2015, we saw a presidential campaign announcement unlike any we've ever seen before. During his announcement, Donald Trump went after immigrants, and specific Mexicans. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. This sent shockwaves across the immigrant community. The fear that DACA would be repealed seemed closer than ever. And along his campaign, Trump promised to deport millions of undocumented immigrants and build an almost 2,000 mile long wall between the United States and Mexico. Oh, I cried. I was really, really sad. I was like, oh, everything I've worked for, my parents, I kind of base it off my parents. I'm like, you know, they're the ones that struggled. They worked here. They got us this living. They, you know, they worked so much that it's kind of like, it's all my parents. So I, when I heard that I cried, I was like, my parents, what are they going to do? You know, because for me, it's kind of easier. Like, I'm young. I can go to college over there, you know do something over there, but here's like, it's all for my parents. So it kind of was really devastating. As of January of 2017, the federal government estimates that close to 750,000 individuals have applied and are now covered by DACA. But with their new leader in office, President Donald Trump has sent mixed messages regarding what will happen to those already under protection from deportation and whether or not the information students provided will be used against them to deport them. They shouldn't be very worried. They are here illegally. They shouldn't be very worried. I do have a big heart. We're going to take care of everybody. We're going to have a very strong border. We're going to have a very solid border where you have great people that are here that have done a good job. They should be far less worried. We'll be coming out with policy on that over the next period of four weeks. So, Mr. President, will they be allowed to stay? I'm going to tell you over the next four weeks. That is up in the air right now in terms of for the new Trump administration and the new Republican Congress, in terms of what they're thinking about. It's still, it's unclear in terms of how they will actually handle that. What I have read and what I've researched up to this point, in terms of many uh, large-scale universities and institutions, uh, quite honestly, what they're, uh, what they're telling the DACA students that are once again at their institutions to do um, is to as quickly as you can get your, if there's financial aid or other funding, anything that's available, get that now. The expectation is um, that DACA will be uh, repealed, uh, as it were, and uh, there, there'll, no one else will be sort of added to those roles. So um, with a number of other uh, immigration-related policies, DACA and others, right now we're just sort of at a holding point. There's a great deal of uncertainty, but most folks are saying that if you're, once again, uh, part of DACA, uh, take advantage of, of anything that you can right now before, again, there's a new executive order or some legislation from Congress. But nonetheless, those who applied are still fearful DACA will be repealed and leave them empty-handed. I don't know, I just feel like, you know, you will, you struggle a lot um, for being an immigrant, not benefiting from a lot of things, we, but I feel like if it's gone, like everything I work hard for, it's like gone. Knowing that you become an illegal back again. Knowing that I worked so hard to help my parents out, go to school and everything will be gone. It's kind of like, wow, like, I don't know. I can't picture it, <laughs> you know. 
To add to the stress of DACA going away, students already struggled to attend higher education with the help of DACA. Deferred action only grants someone legal work status and protection from deportation, but doesn't grant any students access to federal financial aid. And in most states, like here in Wisconsin, students have to pay out-of-state tuition to attend college. For most, it's almost impossible to attend a four-year university and be expected to cover the cost out of pocket. Absolutely not. You don't qualify for financial aid. You don't qualify for any like government assistance and nothing like that. Any uh, student, regardless of status, uh, has the, the same opportunity based on merit to be admitted into one of our universities. So the selection of students to be admitted is basically totally on merit, which shows that the students that actually are admitted are the best of the best, right? Especially here at UW-Madison, where 50% of the students that are apply uh, are, not, are not admitted, right? Uh, the, the problem occurs when the student all of a sudden is admitted and starts trying to go to school and they determine that, well, you have to be uh, a resident for tuition purposes and you are not considered a resident for tuition purposes, so you're going to have to pay three times as much. And that's compounded by the problem that uh, dreamers do not have access to either state or federal aid. So all they can do is try to find as many scholarships as possible work as hard as possible, try to save, try to find a way in which they can supplement or support the tuition, the outrageous tuition that they're being forced to pay, considering that they are actually residents. They, they have paid for years taxes themselves. Their parents have contributed with taxes and, and labor and, and everything for years. And, and yet, they are not considered resident students. They have graduated from our high schools. We have made enormous investments in them K through 12, and yet we bar them from our universities, not because we don't admit them, but because when we admit them, we actually put barriers before them. It's a matter of saying, yeah, we want to help every student in this circumstance. Uh, how can we find other funds, other kind of sources of funds that we can use to support them. And I don't think it's that difficult for an institution as well recognized and as, as highly supported by, by uh, like UW-Madison. Uh, we, we are able to, to get billions of dollars in support uh, to do all kinds of things, uh, research, sports, uh, programs, you name it we should be able to find the, 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 the not very, very large amounts of money to help the few students that we have here that are in this circumstance. But also for the institutions, this is um, a business. And by charging, um, once again, out of state uh, students, um, uh, international students more, uh, quite frankly, that's one of the ways for uh, the public institutions to balance the books. Uh, in Wisconsin, this is not unique to Wisconsin. There are universities across the country that engage in this sort of, once again, practice, um, and that have engaged in it in a much more aggressive manner than the university, than the university system here in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is among many states that don't allow DACA students a way to pay in-state tuition. But currently, what most students are worried about is what will happen to DACA as a whole. Will they be allowed to renew it? Will it be canceled? What will happen to those being protected from deportation? And while we wait for an answer from the Trump administration, students are anxious and on the edge. Take a look. I struggled a lot, um, the oldest, so I don't have an older sibling or anything to help me out. My parents didn't go to college. I think they barely even finished like middle school. So I feel like I had to look through my own. I had to find either a guidance, my advisors. I have to go out and like look for the help. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really hard because you can't say, hey, I'm not, I can't get loans. I can't do this, I can't do that. So it's kind of like, you have to think of the good, questions to ask with trying to get the help for you, but at the same time, not tell them what your situation is here. Right now, with everything going on, 
um, we're not recommending that first time applicants apply because if it were to be canceled at any point, it would be as if they just submitted their own deportation, right? Um, for those who already have DACA, um, the risk is the same because um, we all knew, including myself, because I have DACA, that at, at the time that we applied, there was no um, security that our information would be protected. We knew that at, if any moment, they could easily give our information to the federal government, but nobody saw what, you know, what was coming. Um, but, you know, for those of us who applied, we, we didn't care because the truth is that the positives and the benefits outweigh the negatives, right? That's a mixed message. There's some people that are saying, you know, apply now as quickly as you can if you can once again enroll in the process. There are others that actually are arguing, um, do nothing. Um, that information, and that's another concern, that the information that, that the government, government may have collected already through DACA, will that information now be used to go after them? Uh, there was, if you read uh, the, the, the Cap Times today, Laura Minero uh, talked about, and other students, about what's happening with, with, with the fear and the anxiety of, of what's coming next for them. And, 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 and as again, these are students in our universities. We should be protecting them as much as we can and supporting them as much as we can. The policies that are in place today, there's, there's, there seems to be very little certainty that those policies will be here tomorrow. So trying to plan not only your academic future, your financial future, professional future, becomes just that much uh, more daunting. And I think here in Wisconsin, that's one of the things that Wisconsin, um, that we have to address because, you know, that talent, you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't feel wanted here, it will flow somewhere else, either to a nearby state, in some cases maybe to another country. That's one of the things that makes sort of the United States, that makes America, America is, again, sort of a meritocracy, fair play, again, and, 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 and wanting sort of talented people to stay here and to develop their talents, to contribute to, you know, all that is, once again, that makes America, you know, what it is. Whether there's things that we can do or not, that that's not necessarily the the question legally, but but letting our students know that we do everything possible within the law, right? Everything possible to support them and support them and and provide a safe place for them. I think that is the message. That's the right message to do, especially as I have been talking about how many of them are living under uh, 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 a lot of anxiety and fear. They need to hear from somebody that has authority. You know, at least they, they, they feel like somebody cares. If you find yourself anxious for the road that lies ahead, or if you're just graduating high school and are coming to realize your situation, know that you're not alone in this. Our community has long been organizing to fight for our rights and great resources exist here in our state of Wisconsin. Don't give up the fight. Educate yourself on our laws and the rights we do have. Join causes that shift public opinion so immigrants aren't all regarded as being criminals. The current political climate has created a divided country, and immigrants are in the crossfire. Let's join and stand by one another. If we work together, we can make a difference. On February 13th, we're calling for a Dia Sin Latinos, a day without Latinos, um, because Sheriff Clark has, a, has announced his intentions of enrolling in a program called 287G, um, which would allow his employees to act as ICE agents and question people who look illegal about their status, right? So, of course, that's going to create a lot of fear in our community. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a U.S. citizen or a resident. If you look brown, because of, according to a lot of those people, um, people who look illegal are brown. So they're going to be, you know, interrogated about their status. So we're, call, we're telling people, don't go to school, don't go to work, don't consume anything, you know, because the reality is that for a lot of people, even U.S. citizen children, if something happens to their parents, they're not going to be in school. We also have a lot of economic power. We're consumers, we're tenants, we're 
homeowners, you know, we, we have cars and whatnot. If we don't, if we, we show them that, um, you know, we can really hurt the economy, then maybe they'll listen to us. And that's the only way. In fact, that's the only way they'll listen to us because last year when we did the same thing and we all marched to Madison, um, that's how we were able to stop these two anti-immigrant bills from passing. The dairy industry only produced like 60% of what it usually does. That's huge because this state relies heavily on the dairy industry. I am the president of the Latin Education Council, which is an advisory uh, educational organization. And what we do is we try to provide this kind of advice to individual students. Uh, we give presentations to all our high schools. We meet with the parents and the students. And we give individual advice because each student has very specific individual needs. Uh, so when we go to the high school, we tell them, this is how you can be, have access to the university. Uh, this is what you have to do. This is all the questions that they may have. Say, but if you have any specific circumstance, come and talk to us. We'll meet one-on-one -on -one with you, give you all the options and opportunities that we know are available for each one of the students. VOSIS is an immigrant and workers' rights center. Um, the youth branch that I, I work in is, a, you know, yes, is a multiracial student group that works for, um, that fights for student, immigrant, and workers' rights. And we have started also collaborating, communicating with other similar programs, like at Milwaukee, UW Milwaukee, the Robert and Landis Center, so that we can actually be more successful in partnering to provide support to students and try to do it more and more and more throughout the state of Washington. Joining us now is Citizen Action of Wisconsin Latino Outreach Organizer, Luz Sosa. Thanks for coming in with us today, Luz. Thank you so much for inviting me. So, are there any DACA updates? Has there been any news out of the White House about DACA? So the White House uh, has released a statement last week where um, mass deportations are going to be, uh, you know, the main priority of this administration. However, when it comes to the DACA, uh, you know, the, the DACA status, uh, nothing has been said about that and it has actually been left intact as of right now. So that is the good news um, for, for the DACA students. However, because there is this um, you know, immigration fear that this administration is imposing in the community, a lot of people are, are afraid no matter what, no matter if they have DACA or not. And so the community right now is in panic. And it is very important that we actually, uh, like everybody who has mentioned here in the video, is that we have to make sure that we organize as a community, we come together, and we make sure that we have all the, um, all the legal parts and the, and the paperwork intact before um, anything happens. Wow. And then a few weeks ago, we saw a day without Latinos here in Milwaukee. So what was the outcome of that organized? So, so far we haven't seen an outcome, uh, you know, defeating this, uh, this law, the 287G, where uh, Sheriff Clark is trying to make sure that his sheriffs are uh, immigrant agent, agent, agents. Um, but we, what we have seen is that he is not doing it either. So we are kind of in the in-between mm -hmm. uh, stages. And so, um, so, so far we haven't seen the results that we want, which is him saying that he will no longer do that program. Mm -hmm. uh, none of the state, uh, states here in the, mid, in the Midwest have uh, tried to get into this program. So if he were to do it, he would be the only one in the six states in the Midwest to actually implement this fear in the community. It's not even, uh, you know, it's not even that he's going to target just undocumented people who have criminal backgrounds, but you know, it's actually everyone. And then for students right now, like what um, resources are available for them at Citizen Action of Wisconsin? So Citizen Action is an organization that actually works um, in three main main topics. One of them is the advocacy for healthcare issues. We, uh, uh, we do a lot of um, 
work on the socioeconomic side of the economy. And the third part is voting rights. So we want to make sure that we actually elect champions who are for our community, for our Latino community, um, that will fight for us. And that is why voting is such a, an important uh, part of you know being in the political life. Now, I, know, I understand that DACA students are not able to vote, but they do have, uh, that they, do c they can make a big difference in the voting and in the elections by actually working for candidates that are running currently. And so at Citizen Action, we encourage DACA students to join our organization and be part of the change that we want to create in the city and in the state. And the best way that we can do that, again, is by knocking on doors, making phone calls, reaching out to voters to make sure that we're not only ready for these elections now, in April 4th we actually have elections, but that we are ready to take on the Sheriff Clarks and the Scott Walkers that are actually against our community. So it's very, very important that we organize our community so that they can um, help us out and we can make sure that voters are aware of what, what is happening and the fear that they are imposing. And as it, will it was mentioned before, Latinos have a big impact in the economy. We are consumers, we are business owners. The 53204 uh, zip code is the actual engine of the economy here in Wisconsin. So it's very important that we, that we keep Just organizing. Get involved and keep staying involved. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much for all that information. It was really very informative. <laughs> we yes. will definitely continue to monitor this. And, and thanks for coming on. <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you. So we've come to the end of our special report today. From the studios of Milwaukee PBS in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we thank you for joining us. Thank you, Luz Sosa, and everyone who made this show possible, including our crew working in the studio. Thank you. Immigrants, we get the job done. AOA, immigrants, we don't like that. Nah, they don't play. British Empire strikes back. They're beating us like 808s and hi hats. Out our own game of invasion. This ain't Iraq. Who these Fuji's? What do they do for me but contribute new dreams, taxes, and tool swagger and food to eat? Cool.